uh, for this word of encouragement, God, letting us know that you're with us until the end of time. Amen. Amen. It's a good thought. Amen. Mm-hmm. It's a very good thought. Um, Paul's, Paul, I was, I was reading Paul's epistle this morning, and Paul was saying, if Jesus wasn't crucified, then our faith is void. But he said, but I can assure you that this crucifixion and resurrection are very real. He experienced himself. So I was, I was just rejoicing about that. I said, Lord, just be thankful that, praise God, I'm, I'm saying, <laughs> Amen. Mm-hmm. I mean, we can have all these kinds of things around us, all the hoo-ha and everything. Mm-hmm. But uh, the fact that we are saved is one of the major factors we could be spending eternity with him. Amen. If you've got your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 14, please. I'm going to start reading from verse 22 onwards. That's Matthew 14, verse 22. It says, it's, it just came out of a crusade where they fed, fed uh, thousands of people. And he says here, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship, and to go before him onto the other side. While the multitude, he sent the multitude away, and when he had sent the multitude away, he went up to the mountain apart to pray. It's always a, 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 a good thing to see that Jesus was always moving away to be separate, to be to pray with his Father, to pray to the Father. He, he was he always at time. He spent time in fellowship with God to get direction. And when he had Send the multitude away, he went up to the mountain to pray. When the evening has come, he was there alone. So he prayed like the whole afternoon, actually. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed and tossed with the waves, for the wind was contrary. And then the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went up to them, walking on the sea. Uh, that's quite a way off, isn't it? I mean, he said, he said the boat was in the middle of the sea. And Jesus said, look, oh, this, this, there's a ship on that side. Well, he's going to join them by walking on the sea. So that, that, and the, the wind was boisterous, and it was contrary, and there was waves and thunder and everything. It didn't seem to bother Jesus. I, I, was, I was just reading this for the last two weeks, just that passage. The wind was contrary. Do you believe that when you become a born-again believer, the wind is going to start being contrary? The world system is going to start moving against you. You always, always have that, that, that attitude, you are like a salmon wall, swimming upstream. Because the world wants us to go in one direction. The world wants to guide us into one direction. But the, the Bible seems to make us turn around and walk, go the other way. And the wind is, is always contrary. When I started riding bicycle at age of 8 or 9, my dad says there's only one law with bicycles. The wind is always contrary. And I experienced that for all these years I've been riding bicycles, the wind is always in front. And the, when you're a Christian, I can tell you now, if you've never made Jesus your Lord of your, the Lord of your life, your Savior, and you're going to do it today, I can I tell you now, the wind, the wind will be contrary to that. Because the world doesn't want you saved. The devil doesn't want you spending time with God for eternity. He hates you for living your life with God for the amount of years you are here on earth. Imagine if how he hates you spending eternity with God. So he says, yeah, the wind was contrary. On the fourth watch, Jesus went to them walking on water. Like a casual thing. Yeah. You know, sometimes uh, we are reacting quite badly to situations that come against us. When the world puts up all kind of things against us and around us and stirring all the kinds of, it looks like the boat is being tossed to and fro and the waves are going overboard and you're getting wet, you're getting affected by this, a trial by that, a relation with that, it seems that it, it starts to shake our confidence. But here we see Jesus, he was actually on the shore looking at the storm. And he didn't sit there, make a fire, say, well, I'll wait till morning, maybe the storm passes. He had confidence enough to walk in the middle of the storm. And that's not the first time. 
That's not the first time. There was a time where they wanted to throw him off the cliff. Out of the tabernacle, they pushed him up the cliff. They wanted to throw him down the cliff because of what he was saying. What did he do? He turned around and faced the storm. They walked right in the midst of it. And they could not touch him. It was at that time when he was in the desert and the devil came to him and presented him all kinds of stuff which makes, would make some of us maybe question our faith when you are presented with the riches of the world. Can you imagine somebody telling you, I'm going to give you 100 million, 100 trillion man. Would you question your faith right now or would you say, no thank you, if it means losing my soul. It seems that sometimes Christians' faith have been shaken to the core. And the elite, the Bible says, God's going to shorten the days, lest the elite falls as well. We hear people falling back, backsliding, but we hear also leaders, religious leaders, falling, falling, failing. We, 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 we see that. The church has been affected by a flame of people quitting. Jesus walked, turned around, and walked right in the storm because he had the confidence of who he was. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled. Now I'm asking you, if there's a storm in the sea, I mean, we've seen uh, I don't know, I'm looking, I was looking at the deadliest the, the, the sketch. Those fishermen are going to the uh, Bering Sea and catching all these crabs. And sometimes they've got a nice sea, it's water, it's blue, and it's calm. But sometimes they are in the storm. And the, I mean, I'm looking at the, at the boat, there's another boat following them. And we look at the boat, the boat doesn't go like that, it goes like that. Waves of 30 feet, 50 feet, washing over the all the storm. And these guys have to grab on and hold on, but they're going to catch fish. So when you look at these things, you, you know, and you see, you realize that when there's a storm, it's very unpleasant to be on a boat. And these guys saw Jesus coming. How do you see somebody walking on the, on, the, on the waves or on the sea when these waves are like 20, 30, 40 feet high? Sometimes when you look at that, 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 that the documentary on, on the fishermen, when the, when the wave goes down, the, the, the ship disappears because the waves are higher than the ship. How do you see somebody walking on the sea? And I mean, he's been coming from shore and they're in the middle of the sea. Isn't it? Maybe they were acquainted with Jesus. And they, were, they could notice Jesus. They could feel the, the presence of Jesus close to them. I think sometimes in, in, our, in our state of maybe panic when things come, uh, uh, I mean, with this virus that, was, that struck this planet, there was like a panic move among everyone on earth. And everybody panicked, and everybody started discussing the, the worst scenario ever. But those who are close to Jesus stayed calm. Because they noticed Jesus was in the midst of it. He was still coming to you. Even right in the midst of disaster. Right in the midst of death. Jesus was coming to you. <coughs> because he promised us and we heard this morning. He will be with us until the end of time. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea. They were troubled saying. It's a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway. Jesus spake unto him, saying, Be of good cheer. <laughs> Hello, there's a storm, Lord. Have you not noticed? Look at me, I'm all wet. All the waves are washing over. I'm hanging on and I'm looking, there's somebody coming, and, and the Lord says, Relax. Oh, oh. Have you told somebody who's been desperate, say, Relax, you'll be okay. They look at you like you're very hard. A very peculiar person who tells somebody, relax, it will be okay. And there's a, the waves over there, the boat's going all the way wire. 
I mean, can you imagine Jesus saying, Cheer up, Lord, hello, look at me. This is coming against me. And look at my finances, and look at my marriage, and look at this, look at that, and look at this. Cheer up, it will be okay. Why? I'm here. Because he, I'm here. We forget that. We forget the presence of God. We forget the presence of God and we panic because we are, our eyes are focused on the things that surround us. It's our eyes looking and focus on the one that can get us out of the surroundings. And Jesus said, be of good cheer. <laughs> if, I, if I'm going to be in good cheer in the middle of a storm, how much more joyful am I going to be when the storm is past? Be not afraid. Now, this takes on a peculiar meaning. When you've been addressed by God and telling you, don't be afraid, when you are in the element you know that can destroy you. We'll have a look at this. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. Now that's Peter, amen? And um, Peter was always on the, on the forefront. Club. Somebody wants to attack Jesus, the God, and he put his sword and cut the high priest's ear off. <laughs> I said, oh, you don't need to touch this guy. He was missing the old old thing. He was missing the main vision. He just saw this time was attack. Jesus, I'll defend him, take my sword, <laughs> cut his ear off. And Peter, uh, and, and he said, verse 29, come. One word. One word. That's all that he, that's all that's necessary. One word uttered by the Father. One word uttered by Jesus. One word uttered by the Holy Spirit. Come. Come. Peter's words were more than Jesus' words. He says, oh, if it's you, Lord, bid me to come. And Lord said, okay, come. Because why? And Jesus was assured, I am who you say, who you saw. It is me walking on the water. It is me that is in the midst of your trouble. It is me that, in the, that is with you when you are in the midst of the troubles. He wants, he wants you to have that assurance of faith. It is me. Make sure you know I'm here. They know. They knew it was Jesus. They saw him coming. But he wanted to make sure of that because, I mean, there's a storm. And Peter's a fisherman. He knows what the storm means. Some of us know more about the disaster than we know about Jesus. We know the results of any disaster. And that's what makes us fearful. And that's what our mind dwells on because we know that thing is, can kill us. It will, it will do this, it will do that, it will do this, and the result will be death. We know more about the, the problem than we know about Jesus. And Jesus' answer is, come. Come. And we know, I mean, the story has been so well known. We heard that from Sunday school. And Peter was come down out of the ship. He had, he had that energy to say, all right, you know, I thought it was the Lord, but when he spoke, I recognized not only him, I recognized his voice. Don't you think in our disasters, in our problems, in our situation, in our heartaches and all the, th the things that the world brings to us, we fail to recognize and identify the voice of God. We are asking ourselves, is this God? Is this not God? Is, am I really hearing right? Am I being, did, did I miss God's voice? Did God tell me to do something? We kind of miss because we lack fellowship with God. We lack that intimacy, that intimacy with God. We lack that. You know, I mean, we, we speak, I'm, I'm doing this subject on prayer in the Bible school and I'm trying to bring this across, you know, Prayer is based on the relationship. And everything else is based on the relationship. If you don't know who God is, how are you going to trust upon Him? If you don't know who God is, how am I going to pray to God? 
If I don't know who God is, how would I know that He that is within me is stronger than He that is in the world? Because I don't know who's in me. I don't know Him that much. I know the problem. Oh, yes. I mean, people will describe the problem from A to Z. They will tell exactly this is where it starts and it's going to end up like that. They know everything about it. They've read everything about it. They've read newspapers and books and TVs and videos and YouTube and everything that is possible about the problem. And we ask them to know Jesus with a relationship. You know what we lack in our lives? We lack the building of an altar for ourselves. To have a special place with God. People are bluffing themselves. Yeah, well, I drive, I pray, I pray to God. When I, I'm at work, I pray to God. God is asking us to have a quiet time with Him. God is asking us to build an altar that only you can stand before the Lord. Not you and your friends, not you and this, not you and that person. You alone. All the guys of old, when the victory was achieved, they built an altar to God to give God their honor. So that I can offer my gift to the altar. And sometimes we, we, we don't have that personal relationship because we haven't built an altar before the Lord. Before Him says, Lord, this is my place. The secret place of the Most High. He who abides. He who abides under the shadow of the Almighty. It's good when you drive, you can pray. When you have to work at your tea time, you can pray. Read the Bible. I did it all, all these years. But there's a special place where there is nothing but you and God. And there is an altar. And it's you come to the altar before the Lord. It's your altar. Not yours and your wife's. Not yours and your husband. Not yours and your kids. Your altar. Your private place. Your doorway. Not your right hand won't know what your left hand does. And many of us spend so much time, so many hours, on other things. I want you to think about this. Whatever you spend your time at is whatever you're going to believe. Is whatever you're going to believe. I would ask you this. Are you ready? If God was going to say, today I'm going to present myself before you. Are you ready for that encounter? Let me tell you something. You can never be 100% ready. You think you are ready? Oh, I'm reading my Bible, I'm praying this. Yeah, so that the millions of people do that. But not that the millions are ready to meet Jesus face to face. To have that encounter that will change whatever you believe right now. That encounter that will change something in your life that you know right now is missing. No, 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 none of us can say, oh, I wasn't aware. Every one of us is aware there's something missing when we don't have that relationship. But we spend time with other things, hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. Hindering the relationship. Because nothing that you do, nothing that you focus on right now, will take you to heaven. No possession or the lack thereof will take you to heaven. Jesus said, oh, do that. Imagine that somebody just told you, I'm going to take you, I want you to live with me forever. And you don't spend time. Listen, I better stop knowing this person. I'm going to spend eternity with this person. As we, we are so busy with so many things. We occupy ourselves so many in the world. I'm a busy person. Will we hear the word come and react as Peter did? I guarantee you. <coughs> no. Picture speak louder than words. Verse 29, and Peter came down out of the ship 
and they walk on water to go to Jesus. It is well to, be, to know that He did walk on water. Sometimes we experience a bit of victory in our lives because we dare believe God for that. And now look what happens. But when He saw the wind boisterous, now let me tell you, how come, how come, the, how come He saw the wind boisterous when He was in the water? Did he not know when he was in the boat? What's the difference? I mean, he's in the boat hanging on. I mean, this boat is like. So he knows it's a soul. But now he gets in the boat. Only then did he notice that the wind was boisterous. A boisterous wind is like there's no direction. He, he, the wind goes just haywire. Because now, I've looked into that, uh, when there's a storm on the sea, because of the waves, the wind goes one way, but when the waves step, the wind shifts to the side, and that side, nothing soft, the wind, it will go. When the, there's a sudden in front of it, it will go. So when you're in the sea, the wind must blow this way, but then it turns there, and it turns down here, and then, so that's boisterous. Uh, wind that blows from every direction, that's boisterous. So he says, yeah, but when he saw the wind, was he blind that he didn't see the wind when he was in the boat? No. He knew there was a storm. He was afraid. And beginning to see, he didn't drown, he was beginning to see. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. Now I want you to see the difference here. Because I know we read this, we've heard these stories all the way. I mean, that means preached maybe in Sunday school since ages. But sometimes we read the Bible and fail to notice certain things. Sometimes one word is a whole new meaning to this. I want you to see what's happened here. When I was in the boat, I noticed the wind. But you know what happened? When, when I was in the boat, I could hold on. And I knew if I hold on, the boat will float. It will be like thrown side to side and up and down. And everything, but because I'm holding on, I'll still be safe. But now, I'm in the water, nothing to hold on to. Now I notice <laughs> this wind is bad. Sometimes when you, you launch out in faith, because I mean, you understand, God is with you, and he, he said it this morning, God is with us forever. He hasn't left us. In the midst of your trouble, God is there. He even said that I will make a way out. So right, right there, God is with you. Right there, in, your, in the midst of your trouble, right now, God is there. But you know what? You're still holding on to a few things. and Your faith is not that shattered yet. You just hold on a little bit. Because you, you're, you're quite safe. You know that you know, uh, if I'm in like a financial trouble, I can go to the bank at any time and you know, ask for a loan and they'll... they'll that will be all right. See, there's a bit of, there's a, bit of a safety net. I, I know there's a storm, but there's a bit of a safety net. I can quit at any time. I can go to the bank and ask for a loan. I can I have a friend to say, you know, can you help me? And then God requires you to lean on him. When he says, come, it means let go. See, the word come is not just a word, ah, come on, really like, no, it says, let go. Keep your eyes on me, let go. And when the safety nest was pulled out under his feet, and he was there, and it was not a, the side of the boat to hold on to, because I guess when he got off the boat, you know, he got off the boat, or still holding on to the boat side, and, you know, and he was just getting off the water, and when he saw that, oh, he was actually on the water walking, he let go and he started bowing and he started walking. The moment he was out of reach of the things that kept me secure, then he took notice. This is real. This is real. If I, if, I, if I take my eyes off Jesus right now, that's it. My cookies done. Huh? And, he, and this is what happened. He looked away. And the Bible said, beginning to see. 
Is it what sometimes we, 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 are, you know, we, we hear something or we read or we, are, we pray and we are getting some energy and we say, you know, I'm going to launch out and pray. I know there's trouble, but I'm holding on here because there's always a solution. The world will always offer a solution. The ways of man leads to death. Don't put your trust into man. But now you say, you know what, I'm going to launch out in faith. And only when you let go, do you really notice how bad the situation really is. And the option is, you either go down, or you cry out. And Jesus reached out his hand. And Jesus is always willing to test our faith. The Bible says the testing of our faith creates patience and character. You want character as a Christian? Let go. Let go of the things that you think hold you secure. Is that what we believe? As long as I'm moving on, I'll be okay. I'm not, I'm not too bad. That's not faith. That when you have to walk on water, you take a stick and feel the depth of water first. That's not faith. Jesus is saying to us this morning, let go. I've been trying my faith many times. I was like Peter, big mouth. Saying, ah, Lord, yeah, Lord, yeah. And God said, let's see, let go. I let go of the waterfalls of freezing. I wasn't that strong. <laughs> I remember Pastor Leon. I have the biggest test ever. And God is a gentle God. God is a gentleman. He's a good God. And he will, uh, he'll, he'll let you begin to see. So that you can know you can't make it on your own. You can begin to drink. But the air is here on you. And you can see them all. You can drink. And you can pull up. It says, How's your faith now? Glow, I need you. <laughs> this, the word this morning, let go. Let go. Trust him. Let go. Amen. Let's stand, please.